Hey, I'm Shonda Golden and you're in the vault. We're on a field trip today. We're at PB&J's in Reno, Nevada with the legendary guitarist, Uli John Ross. Hello, sir. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for taking the time to hang out with me here. Thanks for I know me. you've got your VIP meet and greet coming up next. So you're five decades in the music industry. Oh, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Actually, you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So what motivates you just to keep going? It's just my destiny, you know, this is what I have to do. Mm -hmm. I could do other things, but uh, uh, I do that which I, I think is most important for the time that's been given to me. So I love traveling, I, I, uh, I really enjoy touring. Luckily, because there was a time when I didn't. Right. In the 80s I stopped for a long period, 13 years, but now I'm enjoying it again. I'm glad about that. So. Um, yeah, touring is a big part of my life, but I also have a life apart from touring. And what motivates me is just, I guess, yeah, there's, there's a motor in all of us. Right, yeah? there's a motivator there in all of us. There's a motor in all of us, and I uh, want to do certain things, and in order to do certain things, you have to move. That's mm -hmm. what I'm doing. You know? Right, right. So. One of the songs that you're most famous for, the very prolific song, uh, Sales of Sharon. Sales of Sharon. Sharon. What do you think of that song? It has touched generations upon generations. What do you think it is about that particular song? Because you have such a huge catalog. Uh, I, it took me years to figure that out mm -hmm. because it's unlike any other that I wrote, particularly at that time, in, I think in 1977. Um, it has a certain flamenco touch to it, right. which the other guitar players at that time, the, the rock guitar players, didn't uh, incorporate. You know, maybe it was that. Maybe it was that in combination with it starts very light-footed, rhythmically, and then it gets heavy. Um, but to tell you the truth, I don't know why that was. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly one of my better efforts, um, but. Maybe it's also the guitar solo in the beginning because it's unusual to have a guitar lead at the beginning of yes. a piece. Uh, it starts almost like an orchestra piece with a, the with a theme that's also unusual. Maybe it's that, you know? Uh, or maybe the combination of it. it need, you need to ask people more well, qualified me, than me. Yeah, no, you more, tell. <laughs> well, what it is for me is it was something beautiful that I could share with my daughter, similar to Stairway to Heaven. I don't know if it's even beautiful. Is it beautiful? I think it's beautiful. It has beautiful moments in the new middle section where we're going way down and uh, it's like moving along mm -hmm. in some kind of um, eastern, almost like a caravan in the desert. You yes. Know? Um, but yeah, if you think it's beautiful, thank you. Well, it's because kind of rugged beauty, I guess, you know? It's a rugged beauty. Oh, I love that. But it was inspired by something that was not beautiful. Yeah, actually, it's also beautiful. It's got rugged beauty. It was inspired by a famous painting by Michelangelo mm -hmm. in the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Um, and it shows uh, Charon, or Charon, as they say in, in Greece. With, he is um, a Greek mythological figure. He's the ferryman that actually ferries the souls of the departed over the river of Styx, which is the river of oblivion. And once you're on the other side, there's no turning back. Right. That was the ferryman. And Michelangelo painted him kind of a little bit like some kind of mm, somebody with horns, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, quite a scary looking creature. And to me, the story of that, of that song was really, it's about a, a Darth Vader-like figure. And interestingly, it was written at exactly the time when they recorded um, the first Star Wars movie, you know. Uh, and but I didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. But that's what I had in mind. It's not like a person who is uh, who falls to the dark side by uh, being craving all the wrong things for the wrong reasons, right. making the wrong choices, um, and. Yeah, so falling into like some kind of, you know, a trap of black magic. I don't believe in like, these kind of things, you no. know. So that, that, that was mm -hmm. reason, um, the 
story behind that song. Yeah. So most of my songs have a story. Yes. Well, that's one of the reasons why they're so great to listen to, especially to share with your family. I still sit down and listen to music. My daughters and I, that's one of the things that we enjoy cool. doing together. I mean, of course we have music sometimes, you know, as a background, but for me, I personally enjoy just sitting down and listening to music. Mm. So when I was doing my research on you, I came across, first of all, I got this book when I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> I know this book. I, I got this book when I was a teenager. I loved everything about rock and roll muses. And uh, your one of your muses, Monica Deniman, Daneman, excuse me, is in this book, and she was with you for almost 20 years, yeah. right? So she was a great inspiration to you. She was love, great. A great love. She was a great inspiration, and uh, as a person, I've, I've never met anybody like her. She was um, she was just amazing, um, and uh, yeah, we had many friends. And uh, when she died, it was the kind of loss that was irreplaceable. I know, it's you been know, a long time too. Absolutely irreplaceable. Um, yeah. So uh, she ended up in this book, yeah. Uh, she I ended, remember that when, uh, when she, she did this, because this yes. was your house let me, together. Let me show, let it's me on 155. Where is it? I think it's here. Let's I don't have my glasses. Well, my That's glasses. okay. But I can show me. She's someone. right before Angie Bowie. But she, she was an artist, and she was also engaged to Jimi Hendrix. Mm. And so she's... Where's the photo? Oh yeah, that's yeah. your house. See, that was that was a beautiful double thatched roof um, house in Sussex, and that's where where we lived at the time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, lived there for 16 years. Before that, we were in Germany in Düsseldorf. Oh yeah, that's her in in, in her studio. And I remember that person um, coming to the house, doing the interview. Uh, that's your house. Well, it was it was our house. Yeah, that, your was, house together. that was the living room. Yeah, I uh, wrote a lot of music in that house. Yeah, it was it was beautiful, very peaceful, uh, next to the ocean. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was a great time. Um, I don't want to miss that time. That was also the period when I didn't tour. Right. You no. Know, um, well, she was, from what I've read about her and the photos and what I know, she was just absolutely lovely. And she yeah, painted, she was. She, she was lovely. She had, um, she had such a sweet nature. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anything um, like negative in her. Um, she felt a lot of pain when Jimmy died. Uh, she never really got over that, you know. Um, but she turned uh, that pain into positive currency by mm -hmm. actually... Uh, painting amazing pieces of art. We still have uh, many of her uh, oil paintings and uh, about 50% of them um, are uh, dedicated to Jimmy's message and she was so good with that. Um, I remember in fact uh, the day she died or a couple of days Mitch Mitchell called me and he said hey I just got Monica's book and he said she really got it you know she understood Jimmy. Because a lot of people in Jimmy's circle, um, I feel, were not so good for him. Um, they were in it for themselves, and uh, mm, and they didn't really do anything with his legacy. Right. You know, she actually picked up on the message, and then she uh, carried that on. And he told her to do the paintings, because when they met, she was an ice skating teacher because right. she had taken part in German championships. Uh, because uh, she started skating from when she was very little and she was very, very good at it. So she was an ice skating teacher in Geneva, uh, Switzerland. And, um, but uh, they met in, in early 69 and she showed him some of her artwork, you know, and he said he saw her talent immediately uh, because he had an eye for that. He said, you need to paint my album covers, you know, and um, even the night before he died, he drew, um, she had like a painting graph, she drew the album cover that he wanted for the next one, you know. Uh, he, uh, he did that precisely and gave instructions. And after, she, after he died, she, uh, she painted that painting. That was a masterpiece. We still have it. Um, and 
she's done many masterpieces. She was uh, unbelievably good with faces. She could really paint a face after a photograph, because in the end there were photographs of Jimmy, right. you know, from concerts, and make it even more lifelike than, uh, than the photos sometimes. Wow. You know, I was always amazed by that. Mm -hmm. And she did that just without any training. She was just naturally talented. Even sculpture. I've got one sculpture at home which is like a female head. Uh, it's so beautiful. It's almost like an American Indian head. It's just in white. Plus, she was able to do it without any tuition, and it came out like a masterpiece. And I went, wow. You know, because I know about art. Right. I know that. I understand that world. But uh, that kind of, that was like a real achievement to do that. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, she didn't miss a beat. She just knew how to do it. So, um, yeah, I picked up a lot of inspiration from her, particularly also in that year that uh, Sales of Chiron was written. I made uh, a lot of advances because before I met her, I was in the Scorpions, but I was just really more a guitar player and I was asleep to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know, she kind of helped me uh, awaken my, my spirit and um, to become like a real artist. Uh, that's that, what the muse does. Absolutely. So it wouldn't be fair to say and it, that she Yeah, was and it didn't take much, you know, all she needed to say. Like, uh, I remember that we're talking about message, yeah, you know, or, or meaning behind the song. Yeah. I had a couple of songs that didn't have any meaning, you know, and she said, look at uh, these lyrics, there's no meaning in it. Why? And I said, oh, yeah, that's right, you know. And from then on, I never wrote a song that <laughs> meaning, you know. Or um, she was also a really good influence in, in other ways. Um, you know, like uh, at the time when I met her, I was like uh, 20, 21, you know, and um, I was in the Scorpions doing the rock star thing, you know. Uh, I used to drink on stage, and I used to drink whiskey cola. Didn't really make a difference when you're so young with the playing. Sure. Nowadays, I couldn't, I couldn't play with. Uh, I can't do anything with. I can't do anything with But you know, she said, um, <laughs> like, like she came to one of the shows and she said, "Okay, now why don't you play sober today? Just do it for me." And I said, uh, "Oh yeah, okay." And I did it. And it was better. I yeah. never touched alcohol since on, on stage. You know, she had that kind of influence, and she she would have been so good for Jimmy. She was the only one who could have really helped him stabilize because he mm -hmm. was going through such great memories. You know. That's beautiful, and that's wonderful that you have those memories. And together. you see that after, um, uh, like, uh, there was a period when she got a lot of bad press because there was a book which falsely claimed that she uh, saw Jimmy being sick and then she went out to buy cigarettes afterwards. And that was, of course, completely wrong because Monica was, would have never done that. She was like a very together kind of person. And uh, she didn't do like, idiotic things like that. But that was in the book. So we got all these phone calls, you know, hey, you killed Jimi Hendrix. And right. I, oh, my God. I mean, uh, when I met her, um, I quizzed her completely about the, the death of Jimi. And uh, in 20 years, I never had uh, even the, f the slightest, faintest, uh, doubt that her story was the one and there was nobody else there when it happened you know mm -hmm. but her stuff made sense it wasn't a glamorous kind of story and it was always the same story people who are lying they're always making up things and they right. change the story no hers was like watertight and it was just um, a tragic accident he was like so careless you know he thought these sleeping pills of which there were 40 in the in the cupboard he could have if he had wanted to kill himself he would have taken a lot no, he thought they weren't strong because he had one. He couldn't go to sleep. Because you know? so he just the tol tolerance was high. Yeah, uh, and um, uh, but these were very strong. Even four, even four of these would have made your liver to malfunction. Right. Uh, he couldn't live. He had, he had like eight. Uh, it was a lethal dose. Um, but he lived till still one hour in the ambulance. Uh, in the, in the hospital, they worked on him, but they got him back and then he died. You know, so all the other stuff that uh, you read in books or um, you see in these kind of uh, would-be documentaries, all of that is rubbish when it comes to Monica, completely. You know, and I'm glad you're clearing this. Yeah, up. it's kind of you know, it's pathetic. I've, I've seen it all. I've seen how these things develop. You know, so some people were also quite jealous of her. You know, um, because. Uh, 
because she had a, a, a special place uh, mm -hmm. with Jimmy uh, towards the end. And truth is, yes, they didn't spend much time together. Uh, it was too late for that. But Jimmy really gave her a lot of knowledge, and he uh, he actually, um, you know, he chose her um, as someone to uh, carry on um, his message, you know, uh, in some way. And uh, she never said that, but I said that because this is the gist that I got from her, you know. And um, yeah. no, I, I mean all of the stuff that you read, like all baloney. And then you hear 20 different stories right. about how Jimi Hendrix died. It wasn't glamorous. It was just really one of these things. Just sad and And, and it was self-induced. I mean, the guy was just so careless, you know? Uh, one of the greatest artists of all time, but, you know, in certain respects. You know, he was still like a child, and, and unfortunately so. He was so mature in other ways, and so gifted, and he saw so much. But um, he also, there were so many fresh pressures at him at that moment, you know? How do you think that you have been able to sustain and get away from all these pressures? I'm totally different. Mm -hmm. I come from a very protective background, as did Monica. That helps. Right. You know, my dad was not an abusive dad. Uh, I had a good childhood, a good upbringing. Uh, and I was firmly rooted in, in morals, etc. Jimmy came almost, some, in some respect, from the ghetto. You know, because he was like shifted along to these people, these people. Uh, his mom was alcoholic. He loved his mom, but she was alcoholic. There was a lot of domestic strife at home. He didn't have a secure upbringing at all, you know. Um, and he was on the road from when he was like a kid, mm -hmm. literally, um, surviving without any money. So maybe I'm over-dramatizing it, uh, but I think that's what it was, you know. Um, so. I didn't, I, yes, he fell into a lot of traps, as you do when you're a young well, you, rock star. Yeah, you and I, that. too, I fell into traps, but I managed to get out of them because my career wasn't as extreme as his. Right. His was like astonishingly extreme, you know, because he came into um, England in September 1966, and, it was, and he was completely unknown in America at that time. Playing tiny club games, um, suddenly his uh, genius exploded and he became Jimi Hendrix and all the ideas came and in, within uh, two years he had written most of his uh, uh, amazing music, you know, none of which uh, anybody had ever dreamt of before. This stuff was completely unique. Um, but there was a tower. He also took some shortcuts, you know, burning the guitar on stage and so later right. on he felt embarrassed about that. No, I would never do that. I wouldn't destroy a guitar, uh, burning it. You know, it's great for television, but I think it's just wrong. You wouldn't you catch know? me burning a guitar. No, I love guitars. Cool. I never throw them down. No. I, I, I treat them she, like babies. Mm -hmm. You know. So this is Jimi Hendrix. He was like so extreme. You know. Right. And uh, I'm not as extreme. No, I'm maybe she, musically extreme, but um, as a person, I'm just much more mellow and settled. No, yeah. he was mellow too, but he was like. Also in pressure cooker, right. you know, everything happened so fast, and um, some of some part of him couldn't handle that, you know. I think. Right. So now, with your career being 50, going on 50 years, do you ever take time to reflect and say, you know? I do reflect. I, I do reflect. Not at the moment because I'm on this tour and it's like it's like so long and it's really hard to just. Uh, physically stay together and get enough sleep and play right. the shows and do all this. But yeah, when I'm at home, I take, I'm, I'm a thinker, you know, I think for forever. I lo and I love thinking. And yeah, I do reflect uh, about the past. I do reflect about what I think might be the future and the present. You know, I what think, does your future look like? Uh, well, I hope, I hope it looks okay. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to make any predictions because sure. they, they uh, very often don't come true. Um, I certainly want to um, find more time to be fully creative. On a tour like this, I cannot really do that. My creativity here is uh, restricted to the, those hours on the stage, mm -hmm. and I enjoy that. Um, but um, at home, 
I love to write. Um, you know, I'm writing a book, uh, you know, the uh, Sky Academy book about the metaphysics of music. I spend a lot of time doing these things. Um, and most of the time I don't think about my own past. But sometimes I look at it and I, I analyze it and I analyze what I did wrong and what I did right. Sure. And I did many things wrong, you know. Um, I'm always worried when people sit in these talk shows and they say, oh, I would never do anything differently, you know. You know, I, I would do certain things differently. If you don't learn from your mistakes, if you don't even realize you it. You don't grow. Hello, you know. You don't grow. You know, um, yeah. Well, I want to tell you that I am so grateful that you were here with me today. You've been a huge part of my personal soundtrack. Wow. So I'm very, and thank you for sharing this with no. See, with these fingernails, you're not going to be a guitar player. <laughs> no, but I could be a front row with you. I have three long notes to play the flamenco, but they're, at the moment they're all fake. They keep breaking. So I go to the girly parlor and they do But you these. should sit next to me. I can't play with you. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, Who can? You, can't, you cannot Dolly. play the piano. You cannot play anything. With Dolly you. Parton can. Okay, she's Irish, but she's a real singer also. Oh, she's an exception. She's yeah. uh, she's beautiful. She can sing. She writes songs. Yeah, she's great. I'm gonna I've never met her. I want to meet her. Maybe she's Go next. For it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. I can hardly wait for your show. I'm gonna be here tonight. A bunch of us are coming down, and Sacktown's gonna be in the house. So. Who? Sacramento, that's what we call our friends from Sacramento. You Sacramento. call it Sacktown. Sacktown. It's not that far away, is it? No, it's only like two hours. But it's, doesn't it sound Tell cool? Tell me, does it get as hot <laughs> in the summer in Sacramento, like 100 degrees? You're higher we get, up. We're higher up, but we get hotter. It's a drier heat. You get even hotter. It's a drier heat. I don't know. That's not really for me. No? I played a show in Sacramento once in a place with Michael Schenker, and I played some of my Vivaldi's Four Seasons. It was so hot. I literally stood there with my big fan growing <laughs> coat in it. But I was, I nearly died. You must have been a photographer's dream though, with that hair blowing and everything else. You How know, if I shots? don't, if I don't have my fan on stage, I die a horrible death. I don't like it when it gets hot. I need the breath of fresh air. Sure. It's like, it's like flying through wind. I need the molecules to move. Right. You know, um, and I love that. So I love that, so yeah. Sometimes it gets a little chilly on stage, and I don't have it in the winter mm -hmm. um, in, in some places, you know, if they have like lots of or if they have like lots of Well, the weather's supposed to be wonderful this evening. Cool, cool. Well, at and the moment, this too is busy. Yeah. Know, what are we? March. March. And you're not off the road till what, July? No, 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 please. No, <laughs> you're scaring me. No, no, no. Uh, this tour ends. Um, I think the second week or the first end of first week of April. Okay. And I've got uh, a little bit got other things days. going in, in Europe, but I, I'll be able to be great. Okay. And then I've got a vacation to in Greece and a very long one in uh, the Eastern Bloc, Russia and these places. You know, so, uh, but other than that, well, so you're gonna far, have, it's gonna be a great show tonight. I hope so. It we, is. We've had. How do you know that? Because I know everybody that's coming. <laughs> it's, this is my town. This is so Freedom. far, so far, um, every show on this tour has really worked. We're having a blast. Yeah, everybody's crazed to come and see you. Yeah. It's just like a, that's all people are talking it. about. It's, it's a really nice show, and yeah, we're, we're all enjoying ourselves a lot on this tour. I'm very, very happy about that because not every tour is like really successful, you know, but this one is, and. Um, also on the people level, you know, we, yeah. we get on very well, and, and I love the musicianship. We have so many really good musicians on that stage. Sparks are flying every night in all sorts of directions and, and positive ones. Yeah. Right on. Well, I'm going to let right you go on. because you've got that VIP, and they're going to be. Well, no, we're me. no, we're we're playing now. You know, we, okay. we do the two six. All right. Well, maybe I'll get you over to Bazaar. I need a. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take the lead to Starbucks. How's no, that? no, that's too strong for me. I just need one from the bus. Okay. Not even no Starbucks. Man. Okay. <laughs> I'm a coffee moron. You can fix me up with just instant coffee, I'll be fine.
Maybe another time. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, you guys. Okay, guys. Well, See you later.